Um, so today we're going to continue with um, our introduction of one-dimensional diffusion problems. And um, today what we're specifically going to cover is a slightly different way of solving the same problem, right? And so if you recall from last time, um, the governing equation for a 1D diffusion problem looks like right the the derivative of and I'll, I'll um, go um, directly into our discussion of a temperature diffusion problem just to stay consistent with the um, with what we uh, introduced last time right so I'll, I'll use the same uh, nomenclature in the same variable names. So we were in particular modeling um, the change in temperature with respect to time, and that was equal to the heat diffusivity of a soil, of our permafrost soil, which was assumed to be constant, times the second derivative of temperature with respect to depth. Right, so this was our overarching equation. And then um, just to recall what we did is we went through this process of breaking this problem up using a finite difference approach. And we broke up the, the time derivative and the spatial derivative, right? So the, the time derivative looked something like this, t at time i plus 1, location j minus t at time i, location j, divided by delta t. It was equal to, right, and then we had this spatial derivative, so the constant got pulled out. On the bottom here, we had a delta z squared. And in the top, right, what we did is we took a finite difference of a finite difference, right? So we did that, um, the, basically the, the first derivative at the top of our cell, and then the first derivative at the bottom of our soil layer. And then we took the finite difference of those two and we got something that looked like t uh, t at j minus 1 minus 2 times t at location j plus t at location j plus 1, right? And... Again, if we, if we denoted that all of these were at time i, we came up with a solution that was what we called explicit. So, so this is an explicit solution. And if we rearranged the math, we got something like t at time j time i plus 1 was equal to t at time uh, location j time i plus... Um, 
D over times, let's say times delta T over delta Z squared, which we called S in your textbook, times T at J minus one time I minus two times T at J time I plus T at location J plus one. Oops, ran out of room there. T J minus one time I minus two T J time I plus T J plus one time I, right? So, um, What I what I'd like to do is is simplify this one step further and pull out that s right so um, simplifying further right if we if we pull out this s and we recognize that we have uh, two temperatures at location j time i we get something that looks like this. J time I plus one is equal to S times T J minus one time I plus one minus two S times T location J time I plus S times T location J plus one time I. Okay. okay, so this is the explicit solution to the 1D temperature diffusion equation that we introduced last time in the Jupyter notebook, right? You ran through a version of this and um, one of the things that we did, right, is if you look at what goes into S here, right, what's in D is largely material properties. So it's the bulk density of the soil, the thermal conductivity of the soil, the specific heat capacity of the soil, and then the, the thickness of the layers we're simulating and the time steps that we are using for our simulation, right? And I hope what you saw towards maybe the end or you know, sometime between the end of last class and now was that if, if you change these variables, delta T or delta Z independently of one another, at some point you get to a point where this set of equations results in some instabilities, right? If, if you can think of that as being if S gets large, right, so either your time step gets too big or your spatial step gets too small relative to the time step, you get a really big number here on the right side of the, on the, right side of the equation here, right? So this, this becomes big. You're adding that increment to this initial temperature and then that propagates through the system. Right, so you get something big added to something small. At the next time step, you get something even bigger added to something small, and so on and so forth. Eventually, it, it, it blows up, right? Like it, you get some warning or some error that the computer has, um, you know, divided by a zero somewhere, or, you know, you're, you're getting an overflow warning or error saying that, hey, this number is too big. Or it actually finishes, but you plot it and the numbers are like, you know, something times 10 to the 73rd, right? Something that doesn't make sense as a temperature. Okay, so, so that's what's known as instability, right? So the model becomes unstable. Um, so we'd like to avoid that if possible, 
So the question we ask is, um, can we formulate this solution in such a way that, um, that we can get something that's, that's unconditionally stable, right? That, that, that solves without having to worry too much about um, right, what the temp temporal and spatial steps layers are, okay? So if, if we go back to this equation, when we split up our temporal and our spatial derivatives, you'll recall that we made a, a, an important choice here, right? So the choice that we made was that we decided that that spatial derivative we were going to compute, that, that's, you know, the, the so-called Laplacian, Right. Um, when we were going to compute that spatial second derivative, we were going to do that at the current time step, right, or at the previous time step. Okay, and that, that allowed us to have one equation in, in, in one unknown, right, so this was one equation, the only unknown was this time at, uh, this temperature at location j and time i plus one. And we could solve for everything, everything else, right? Okay, so let's go back and let's rewrite that equation. And instead of choosing to do this spatial derivative at the previous time step, we're going to compute it at the current time step, right? Um, and then we're going to have to to do a kind of sidebar or a a refresher of some basic linear algebra to show that, in fact, we can, we can use some linear algebra to, to help us out to solve this problem, okay? So, so let's uh, rewrite, so, whoops, you're seeing my Star Trek watching habits. It's what I like to fall asleep to most nights. Uh, so, okay. So rewriting the finite difference solution this time computing the spatial derivative at the current time step okay this becomes t location j time I plus one, so this isn't going to change, minus T location I, or location J, sorry, time I. So the temporal derivative, at least as written, is not going to change. This is going to equal D over delta Z squared. Okay, and this is t location j minus 1. This is now going to be at time i plus 1. Minus 2 location j time i plus 1. Oops. Two times the temperature location j time i plus one plus t location j plus one time i plus one. Okay. And then let's simplify to get t j i plus 1 minus t location j time i 
is equal to s times tji minus 1 time i plus 1 minus 2 s location j time i plus 1 plus s t location j plus 1 time i plus 1. OK. So now what we're actually going to do is um, we have a whole bunch of, of temperatures at at the, the next or the current time step and only one temperature at the previous time step, right? So I'm now going to resolve my equation, right? Um, such that my T, at, all my T's at time I are on one side of the equation and all my T's at time I plus one are on the other side of the equation, right? So this becomes T at J, and if I get the math wrong here, please let me know, because I'm doing algebra on the fly, and algebra was like, what, eighth grade? Okay, so um, this goes over here, and these all come over here, right? So this is going to give me something like a minus... S times T J minus one time I plus one plus one plus two S at j time i plus 1 minus s. Why does it keep switching over to eraser? Minus s times t j plus 1 time i plus 1. Did I do that right? Does the math work out OK? OK. So at the moment, this looks sort of weird, right? So um, in principle, it's these t's at time i plus 1 that I want to know. Right, so it, it, at the moment, it looks like I just have one equation and three unknowns, right? So I have this one constant, right, this, this known here, t at location j time i, and then all of these three things are the things that I actually want to know, right? So for the moment, at least, this looks like is something that's indeterminate or something that I can't solve. Okay, so now we need to kind of pivot into um, do a side note or a sidebar on linear algebra. Okay, so this is going to be a sidebar on linear algebra. Okay. So, and in particular, um, um, we will need to multiply a square matrix by a vector. Okay. So let 
A, and then the, the notation I'm going to use for matrices and vectors is maybe slightly different than what you've gotten in the past. I apologize if it's different. Um, this is just, for whatever reason, this was like the MIT style of doing matrices and vectors, and it's, it's just different, right? So uh, a matrix is a capital letter with a double underline. So let's make this a three by three matrix. So A was uh, A11, A22 on the diagonal here, A33. This would be A12, A13, A21, a two three, a three one, and a three two. Right. So the first index, the first index on the subscript here denotes which row you're in. So this would be row two, row three, and the second index indicates which column you're in. So this is column one, column two, column three. Okay. Okay, so let's now let the vector x, so this will be lowercase single underline. This will be what we call a column vector, and it has x1, x2, and x3 as its elements. Okay. And finally, let B equal this column vector that is B one B2 and B, oops. B3. Okay. Okay. So now if we if we have an equation, so Um, these can be related to one another by, so B equals A, the matrix times X, right? So this is a matrix vector product. We know we can do this because this has dimensions three by three and X has dimensions three rows by one column. And so B, right, these inner dimensions have to be the same and the final product will have dimensions that are dictated by these outer two dimensions here. Right, so it will, in this case, because A is square, be three by one. All right, so now if we put the elements together, right, if we write this out explicitly, this would look like B1, B2, B3 equals A11, A12, a one three, a two one, a two two, a two three, and a three one, a three two, and a three three, and finally x one times x two times x three. Okay, so. 
I'm going to do this explicitly, so I'm going to write this out. And if you remember from when you first learned, like I think maybe at some point you do some matrix vector algebra in like as a sophomore or junior in high school. I don't know, do you all remember this at all? Where you had to like, the thing that was super frustrating for me about this was that Right, to compute all of these, you had to like point at two things at the same time and remember that they were multiplied together, right? So you, you'd point at like, okay, well, you know, this is like uh, this times this plus this times that plus that times that, and then this, right? And so you're pointing with two hands and then you're like, I can't write this down because my two hands are just keeping track of the, the bookkeeping, okay? Do you, do you all remember being frustrated like that, like at some point? Okay, I'm gonna show you a hack that I learned in grad school um, by taking a class by a guy by the name of Gilbert Strang. If you ever get into linear algebra stuff, um, uh, he's posted like a bunch of lectures online and, and they're actually super great, like especially these kind of intro linear algebra um, concepts. So it turns out that, um, we can, we can actually solve this, or we can, um, we can do this multiplication by, okay, so on the left-hand side here, nothing is gonna change. B1, B2, B3, okay. But on the right side, so the hack that Gil Strang taught us, right, is that we can actually um, partition this matrix into three column vectors. So A11, A21, A31, and then A12, A22, and A32 and then A13, A23, A33. And then these, the elements of this X vector here just become scalar multipliers of each one of these column vectors. Oops. Okay. So then it becomes a lot more straightforward to figure out how you do this multiplication, right? Because then it's just all of these elements will be multiplied by x1, all of these elements will be multiplied by x2, all of these elements will be multiplied by x3, right? So this becomes a system of equations that look like, okay? So the first equation in this would be B1 equals A11 times X1 plus A12 times X2 plus A13 times X3. B2 is equal to A 2, 1 times x1 plus a 2, 2 times x2 plus a 2, 3 times x3 and b3 equals a 3, 1 times x1 plus a 3, 2 times x2 plus a 3, 3 times x3. Okay, all right, so let's look at that for a second. 
So, is, is that clear how we got there to everybody? And a lot clearer than pointing and adding and stuff? Okay, so, so it turns out this is, um, this is a system of equations. All of our Bs and As are known, right? They're just the, the coefficients in our metric, matrix. So let's say all of our Bs are known, all of our As are known, and all of our, our Xs are unknown. So we have three... We have three equations in three unknowns. So this, this system of equations is solvable, right? Like there exists a unique solution to this set of equations, okay? Um, at least, again, the math people are gonna slap my hands. That's not entirely true. We could talk about null spaces and blah, blah, blah. Um, but uh, the, under, under, m under a lot of circumstances, there will be a unique solution to this equation, right? One just can't be a multiple, one of these equations can't just be a multiple of the other equations, right? So, but if you look at any equation individually, right? So if we only looked at this middle equation right here, right? It would appear to us that we have one equation in three unknowns, right? Because it looks like, okay, you have one equation and you have these coefficients, but you don't know x1, x2, and x3, okay? It's only in the context of having these other equations that we actually have a system of three equations and three unknowns. And what I want to do is immediately after the break is if we scroll back up here, and if we look at this equation again, right, we'll convince ourselves that we also have temperatures at location J minus one at time I, and temperatures at location J plus one at time I, so at the, at the previous time step. So this system, this equation here is just one of a system of equations that relate our B vector, which is our temperatures at the previous time step, a, which is a bunch of coefficients here, our matrix A, which is a bunch of coefficients here, times another vector, T, which is the temperatures in the profile at the next time step, which we want to solve for, okay? So let's take a break there, come back in five minutes, that's like 11.17 or so, and then we'll, we'll, we'll finish solving this equation, system of equations. So what I want to do now is I would like to take this system of equations and I'd simply like to repopulate it with the constants and coefficients that we already have. But I, in order to do that and have it make sense, what I need to do is ex expand um, the temperatures that we're looking at to five temperatures and just neglect the equations for the first and last temperature, okay? So, so what we'll do is um, now consider our um, temperature profiles at time i and i plus one as vectors, All right? So this would look like, and again, I'm, I'm going to do I'm going to do five here, but we're only, we're not going to worry about like the first, the first and the last, the first and the fifth, 
right? So this would be t1 i plus 1, t2 i plus 1, t3 i plus 1, t4 i plus 1, t5 i plus 1, okay? So this would be like the temperature time i plus 1 and the temperature at time i would equal t1 i, t2 i, t3 i, t4 i, t5 i. Okay, so let's write out, write out the system of equations for T2, T3, and T4 using the coefficients above, okay? So what I wanna do is actually here, start off with temperature three because it's the one in the middle. And I think that this will kind of underscore my, my point here, right? Where we're, where we're going. So let's start with temperature three. So temperature three, and if we go back up here to this equation, this would be temperature three at time i. So this is temperature three at time i would be equal to, I, and let's make sure that I, okay, so this would be uh, S minus S times temperature Three minus one is two. So this would be S times T. Three minus one is two. So this would be the temperature at location two time I. Right, and then this would be, oh, this is a minus S plus one plus, this would be time i plus one, sorry. One plus two s times the temperature at location three time i plus one. And then minus s at times the temperature at location four time i plus one, okay? All right, so now we're kind of back to where we were, but we recognize now that it, it's not so much that these are, these are unknown independently, right? These are, these are just the unknown equations at, or unknown temperatures at a different location. So if I fill out T2 time I, similarly, this would be minus S times T1 at time I plus one, plus one plus two S at T2 time I plus one, minus S, T3 time I plus one, okay? And if I do the same at location four, it's not 
right? Skipping ahead. Okay, this would be t at three time i plus one plus one plus two s times t at four time i plus one minus s t five time i plus one. Okay, so let's just say that we actually only have five soil layers, right? And we'd have to impose these things at the very top of our domain and the very bottom of our domain. And what were those things called again? What was the phrase that we used to describe those in the soil column? The boundary conditions, right? So we had to describe boundary conditions. We had to set them. And the net effect of what we did in setting those boundary conditions, saying that our top boundary condition was just going to be the air temperature fluctuating around a constant, and the bottom boundary condi condition was just going to be a constant at the mean annual air temperature, was that we effectively said that, well, T1 here and T5 are known. So the only unknowns here we have are T2 at I plus 1, T3 at I plus 1, and T4 four at I plus one, and everything else is known, right? So in fact, this system of equations is, is solvable, right? There's five equations and five unknowns, or three equations and three unknowns, and we know T1 and, and T5, right? They're given to us as boundary conditions, okay? Okay, so how can we turn this into something that looks like a matrix vector equation, right? So if we then combine, so if we um, recast, recasting the above as a matrix vector equation, we would get, okay, on the left, it would be T1, T2, T3, T4, T5, and these would all be at time I. And this would be equal to, okay, and again, I'm going to skip, I'm going to neglect the first row and the last row here. Okay. And in equation two here, there's no, right, there's no T1 and there's no T5. So... The first and last elements of this are zeros. And then we have a minus s, a 1 plus 2s, and a minus s. All right, so this would be minus s, 1 plus 2s, and a minus s. That's for the third one, you're right, sorry. I'm starting in the middle again. So zero and zero, minus s, minus s, and one plus two s, okay? Okay, and in temperature, the temperature equation two, T1 does appear, and it's multiplied by minus s. So the first element here is minus s. The next element is 1 plus 2s. And then T3 appears. It's multiplied by minus s. And then we have two zeros. 
Okay. And similarly for T4, temperature one and temperature two do not appear. So this would be zero, zero. And again, we're gonna have this same pattern here, right? So minus S, one plus two S minus S. So that's our matrix, and there's some special characteristics of this that I'll talk about in a second. And, but this is multiplied by T1 at time I plus one, T2 time I plus one, T3 time I plus one, T4 I plus one, T5 I plus one. Okay, okay. All right, so what's special about this matrix, okay? Does this matrix have any unknowns in it? No, right? So the only things that appear in this are products of constants. So the diffusivity, again, so inside there, inside S, there's five things inside S, the bulk density, the thermal conductivity, the soil heat capacity, the time step, and the spatial step. Right? Those are all things that either we go out to the field and measure, we look up in a book, or we set as model users. Okay? That's one special thing. So these are constants. This, this does not change over the course of a, of a simulation. Okay? Um, the other thing that's special about this is that it has a very special pattern. Right? So um, this is what we would call tridiagonal. Right, so there are only elements on the main diagonal and the two first off diagonals, so the upper right diagonal and the lower left off diagonal, the first off diagonals, right? Otherwise, it's zero. Okay, so that's actually pretty cool, and, and programming-wise, that makes it super easy because there's this command diag where we can just set what's on the diagonal of a of a matrix, right? So that's, that's pretty cool, okay? Um, in addition to that, right, well, uh, there's one more special property about this matrix that I wanna share in a second, okay? Okay, so let's now write this in matrix vector form. So uh, writing, out this equation in matrix vector form we get right the temperatures a vector of temperatures at time i is equal to, we're going to call this A, there's not really a good name for it, and that's going to be multiplied by the temperature vector at time I plus 1, right? So this, just to be explicit, this is known from last time step or the initial condition this is constant its material properties and time step, spatial step. And this is what we want to solve for. Okay. 
Okay, so if if you all, right, and so I, I know that some of you have at least had some linear algebra, but um, like the the college level linear algebra class, right? But even going back to that like high school level like kind of linear algebra thing, right? This we we basically like if these were constants, right? If this was a scalar equation and a was a constant, all you do to solve for t at time i plus 1 is just divide t at i by that constant a, that scalar a. But this is a matrix vector equation, so what's the kind of equivalent operation for dividing t at time i by a? Do you remember that? Yeah, so we basically, we multiply both sides by the inverse of A, right? So we can solve this equation as follows, right? So the solution, T, at time i plus 1 is just equal to a inverse times t at time i, okay? And so if i explicitly, right, if I explicitly write this out in pseudocode, this would look something like my t at next is equal to and in NumPy, it's just, we're going to use something called pinv. I'll tell you why in a second. pinv a times t at the last time step. Okay. Okay, so the last thing that's um, important about a, right, which is full of constants. So we've said that it's, you know, it's full of constants, so there's nothing that's time varying inside A, right? And it's tridiagonal. The other properties that it has that al allow us to compute um, a inverse are that it is square, it is symmetric, and it is also what's called positive definite. And don't worry about what that means, but if you ever hear that, it's, it's positive definite, okay? So that means it has an inverse. So we can compute an inverse, or more accurately, we can let the computer compute the inverse, right? And then we just take that inverse and we multiply it by the temperature profile at the previous time step. Okay, so this is our implicit this is our implicit solution to the 1D heat diffusion equation. Right, and and that's basically it, right? We have to be careful and specify what those temperatures are on the boundaries, right? And that corresponds to the first and last elements of our vectors, t at i plus 1 and t at i. But otherwise, it's, it's, it's that straightforward, right? So mechanically, um, you'll see that when on Thursday, when we look at some implicit code to solve the same set of equations, it actually looks a little bit easier, a little, a little more straightforward than the explicit solution because all we're doing is we're inverting this matrix and doing a matrix vector multiplication. Um, 
And so on some level, it's, it's a little bit cleaner than our explicit solution, right? So what are the advantages of this? Well, one, like I said, this is unconditionally un, um, stable. So you don't run into that problem of having to tweak your, um, your time step and your spatial step, right? You don't have to worry about changing the spatial step or the temporal step and then running into instabilities in the, in the model code, okay? What are some disadvantages of it? Well, as you might imagine, you know, if, if t, so a is square, and so if t, let's say we're solving for a temperature profile, not in a soil, but let's just say longitudinally along the Mississippi River, from, you know, up in the Yellowstone, right? So somewhere up in Montana, all the way to the outlet in the Gulf of Mexico, right? And we're doing that every, let's say, 100 meters, okay? That's probably millions of spatial steps. So T will be, right? T will be the, the, the temperatures from all along that stretch of river, so it's going to be, you know, millions by one. The A matrix will be dimensions like millions by millions, right? So you have a really, really, really big square matrix. And, um, so you're car and mostly at zeros, right? So you're carrying around a lot of zeros. There's ways to kind of get around some of that using what's called sparse solvers. But you're still computing this, this inverse, right? So you still have to invert the matrix somehow. And I'm not going to get into the numerics of, of how matrices are inverted. It's interesting, but it's not the, uh, this class is not the appropriate place for that topic, okay? Um, there's many ways numerically to do this. There's many ways to do this even in the, in the, in the event that A is n not exactly positive, definite. Um, there's some approximations to it. Um, P inv is actually kind of one of them. Um, it's called the more Penrose pseudo inverse. Um, but our matrix, by nature of the way it was constructed, will be invertible. So this inverse exists. It may just be very computationally difficult to compute it, right? And then doing that matrix ve vector multiplication might be complicated. Okay, so there's pluses and minuses to doing it this way, right? So it's a tr it's a trade off. Okay, so like I said, Thursday we will be going over um, that next example notebook in the, in the um, module three part of the repository. You'll get to see how this actually works in practice. Um, and then I'll introduce the next Jupyter notebook assignment. Okay, any questions? All right. Thank you all. Have a good day.